Gentlemen, Victory Baptist Church, Paducah, Kentucky. Is there anybody out here that's never been through a trial? Anybody never, never had a heartache? You know, we don't, we don't understand the path that we, that God leads us down sometimes. But we have to trust Him. Amen. Amen. He's promised, I will never leave thee. Amen. Nor I, I sang this song this afternoon. I had several folks ask me if I would sing it again this evening. God makes no mistakes. Mm.
Now you cry in a river full of tears with an aching, broken heart. Have you prayed and prayed, but no answer came in an hour or so? Thank you. 
you uh, come and preach for us tonight. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be back here at uh, your church and in the pulpit of uh, Pastor Fletcher. And again, I want to reiterate and just say thank you for hosting the meeting this week. Uh, once again, to all the ladies, all the men who fed us over the last couple of days, uh, it was uh, very, very good, very excellent, and as always, and uh, we appreciate it. Uh, I appreciate it. I know all the preachers appreciate it very, very much. Uh, tonight, I have found out that I am the, the lone speaker, and as a result, I've got to make up for two speakers. Amen. But uh, for you uh, who came in spite of that, and in spite of the fact that the World Series starts tonight, uh, um, we're going to get you out on time. Because uh, I, I'm a preacher that likes to be light, and so I know if I get you out a little bit early, you can watch the World Series, you might like me a little bit better. In fact, my message might even be a little better if I get you out just a little early, so you can see that. And, and Brother Jones, he's just dying to see the World Series. He's such a sports enthusiast. <laughs> Try not to lie in church, but, uh, but it does start tonight, and so maybe we'll get out in time to see, uh, to see a little bit of it. Uh, you know, I've been uh, bragging over the last couple of days that I made it from Indianapolis a five-hour and 11-minute trip in three and a half hours. And, I, and, and it was real kind of a claim to fame over the last couple of days. And because uh, uh, I know others from our church, it took them a lot longer than that. And, uh, and, and I've just been bragging for the last two days, I made it in three and a half hours. Left at 12.15, got here at 3.45, and... And then my bubble was burst this evening, and I found out that y'all are an hour behind us. <laughs> so, I'm not really sure how long it took me, but uh, it must have taken me at least four and a half hours, hours. Four and three and a half hours. So I was aggravated. You beat my record. I had four hours and 20 minutes. Well, I can tell you were upset. <laughs> and, uh, so, anyway... Uh, I guess it's going to take me a, long, a little longer to get back. Uh, oh, you go back an hour quicker. What's that? You get back an hour quicker. I, I guess. <laughs> yeah, two and a half hours. Going back, I'm not sure. But anyway, I'm going to get home uh, eventually. Uh, I want to say thank you to uh, Pastor Fletcher for inviting me back again this year to, uh, to preach to you and to preach uh, this meeting. Uh, I'll tell you, I, I just enjoy just remembering. The, the, the stories of Louisville. And uh, I was telling Brother Sylvan uh, how, um, how I was affected personally. I was about 26 years of age back then, and uh, I, I was affected personally uh, from the things that took place there in Louisville and the two times that I was there. And uh, it, it, it shaped my life. It changed my life. It changed my thinking. And uh, I'm just grateful that I can be here this week and uh, hear those stories again, uh, put them in remembrance, uh, and I hope that each of us have, have, have done that very thing. You know, a few years ago, my father came to me and said, uh, uh, Gerald Fitty, uh, who is an attorney uh, down, uh, down in Texas, uh, he, uh, uh, he, he spent, I don't know, $100, $150, something such as that, to go on a Baptist history revival tour through Kentucky and Tennessee. And uh, he cannot go. It's already paid for. And uh, he called me and said that uh, anybody that wants to go could take his place. Uh, I said, well, I'll go. Now, I, I, I decided to go, and I volunteered to go, because I love Baptist history. And uh, I didn't really learn much Baptist history in college. And so the Baptist history that I've learned, I've learned since uh, I've been out of college, and I went to a Baptist college, and still didn't learn much Baptist history. And so uh, pretty much everything I've learned about Baptist history has been since then, self taught. And so uh, before he could ask somebody else, I volunteered and said, I'll certainly go. And I was in kind of one of those moods, one of those preacher moods, I wanted to get away for a while, and it was going to be a five-day trip. I had no idea what it was about where really I was going to go, what was taking place. 
uh, who the preachers were. Uh, I just knew that I had to show up at 5 o'clock in the morning in Ohio on a Monday morning. <clears throat> About two years ago. So I drove over by myself, stayed in a hotel that night by myself, got up early that morning, and about 5, 5.30, made my way to this church over in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, when I walked in, uh, those that knew me uh, kind of looked at me like, what are you doing here? <laughs> and uh, because, uh, well, I won't tell you why, but uh, they kind of looked at me like, what are you doing here? And before the week was over, I, I found out that those books were true because they ver verbalized that also. They were shocked that I was there. I guess they were shocked that a Baptist preacher would, would be interested in Baptist history. <laughs> and so um, we, we uh, spent uh, five days there and uh, toured uh, your great state of Kentucky and Tennessee and crisscrossed and, and, and just had a, a wonderful time. And I'm going to talk to you today just a little bit about uh, that trip. And being that uh, you all are good Kentuckians, uh, I thought maybe you would like uh, some of these stories, and maybe, uh, maybe for the first time, uh, you'll hear some of these stories of your great state and the great church planters of the 17 and 1800s that uh, evangelized your state. And uh, as a result, uh, probably your state, you call it. And uh, many Kentuckians and Tennesseans through the years, back in the 50s and 60s, they migrated up to Indiana. And so uh, our churches were filled with, uh, with uh, good Christians from Kentucky and Tennessee, West Virginia, mountains of West Virginia. And uh, they came up to Indianapolis and Michigan and various places, and they filled our churches. You all filled our churches. And uh, we, we had a, a great, great boom because of uh, the migration of, of Kentuckians and Tennesseans back in uh, the, the 50s and 60s. And, so I thought maybe you would like to uh, be reminded, maybe for the first time, here are some of the stories of the great church planters of the 1700s and 1800s. And I hope it will be a blessing to you. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your goodness, your greatness. Uh, we're so thankful that you are mighty and magnificent and marvelous in so many ways. Amen. And Lord, I thank you for these men, for these women. Uh, I thank you for... The, the common bond that we have in Christ Jesus, the common bond that we have as far as the unregistered church is concerned, uh, the, the lordship of Christ over his church. Lord, we're, we're so thankful, so grateful. Uh, we're so grateful and thankful for those in the past that, that preached the gospel and established churches, and because of their work, uh, we receive Christ, and because of our work, others receive Christ, and it just goes on and on and on when we're faithful. And so uh, I just pray that this message and the history that we're going to share this evening uh, will be a blessing to everyone who is here. And we just ask you to be with us and guide us and direct us. You'll be honored and glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. While on my Baptist History Revival Tour in 2013, I learned one main thing about the great Baptist church planters of the 1700s and 1800s. They all loved Baptist doctrine, and they all suffered persecution for it. Over a five-day period, we visited graveyards, climbed fences, walked through pastures, uh, shoot away cattle, trespassed on private, private property, and, uh, and searched through the woods to find the grave sites of these great men of the faith. Let me tell you about just a few of them. J.M. Pendleton and J.R. Graves promoted a belief called landmarkism, which purported that Baptist churches were the true churches of Jesus Christ. They both were educated and wrote books that we might remember. They believed every man, whoever lives, is influenced by another. They wanted people to remember their doctrine. In fact, the Southern Baptist Convention, because they were Southern Baptists of that day, uh, the Southern Baptist Convention of their day rejected them and rejected many of their teachings. They, then there was a man by the name of Shubal Stearns. He founded Sandy Creek Baptist Church in North Carolina. North Carolina was an Episcopalian state, and the Episcopalians persecuted 
the Baptists. The Baptists were jailed, hung, and their property was confiscated. So they fled over the mountains to Kentucky and Tennessee. They were called the Over Mountain Men. As a result, they planted over 1,000 churches. May I remind you, persecution always causes the gospel to flourish. Next, we learned of Titus Lane. Now, Titus Lane, he hated Baptists. But one day, his curiosity got the best of him, and he went to hear Schubel Stearns preach. After riding for 40 miles and listening to the gospel, Lane got saved. He became the first pastor in Tennessee. This evening, how many have heard of the Cumberland Gap? This evening, how many here have heard of the Cumberland Gap? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lewis Craig's church was in Virginia. It was illegal to preach without a state license, but he did anyway and suffered for it by being jailed. Lewis is famous for his traveling church. He led 600 church members to relocate from Virginia to Kentucky. Today, you couldn't lead five church members across town. But he led 600 church members to relocate from Virginia to Kentucky. And all the Kentuckians said, Every member was a missionary. They started churches everywhere they went. Many were scalped by the Indians. Once again, all of the Baptist church planters suffered for keeping the faith. They suffered for proclaiming the faith. They suffered for sharing the faith. They were persecuted for staying in the faith. And they suffered for defending the faith. May I say this evening, if we are going to be the preachers, the church members, the Christians, that Christ would have us to be. If we're going to do the work of God that God has called us to do, I want you to know that we will be persecuted. We will suffer and be persecuted for keeping the faith, for proclaiming the faith, for sharing the faith, for staying in the faith, and for defending the faith. Amen. I appreciate these pastors, these preachers that are here tonight that have uh, been at it for a long, long time. And what an example you are to we very young men.
And I try to act like Christ to the best of my ability. I am a believer because of my faith in Christ. I am a Christian when I act like Christ. I am a disciple when I follow Christ and do what He wants me to do. I'm a fundamentalist because I believe in the great cardinal doctrines, the main doctrines of the Word of God. You see, you may disagree with me on some things, and I may disagree with you on a few things, but I want you to know, and I believe that I can say this with all my heart, that every single one of us here tonight, every pastor, every preacher here tonight, we believe in the great cardinal doctrines of the Word of God. Amen. And those side things should not separate us. That's right. Those main things, those cardinal doctrines should that, that we hold to and that we believe and that we preach. The virgin birth, the incarnation of Christ, the second coming of Jesus Christ, his, his death upon the, the cross of Calvary, the great main things of the Word of God. We might disagree on eschatology and, 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 and other things about the book of Revelation, but I want you to know, we believe one thing, and that is Jesus Christ is coming again. Yeah. And those great cardinal main truths should hold us and bind us together. Amen. And we should allow, allow the things that we disagree on that are sometimes minor <laughs> separate us. I'm a fundamentalist because, because I believe in the great cardinal doctrines, the main doctrines, the most important doctrines of the Word of God. Amen. Amen. I'm a Baptist because I believe in the great root principles of our Baptist history. I, I, I believe, I believe in salvation by faith and faith alone. I, I believe, I believe that the New Testament church is composed of scripturally immersed believers. I, I believe today that in the autonomy of the local church and the priesthood of the believer, and that means I believe in eternal security. Amen. I believe once you're saved, you're always saved. But I also believe, as a Baptist, in the principle of religious liberty, the principle of religious freedom. <coughs> and as Baptists, we believe in religious freedom for all. That's right. We believe in religious freedom not only for Baptists, we believe in religious freedom for Muslims. And for Methodists. And for Catholics. And for Atheists. Baptists are about the only group that believe in religious freedom for all. That's right. Because nobody else wants to take our freedom from us. That's right. Because yeah. we're not like them. But we're the only ones that believe that everyone should have the ability to experience soul liberty. You know what that means? You can believe what you want to believe, and I can believe what I want to believe. Right. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, Amen. Amen. That's right. Amen. I'm a Baptist because I believe in the great four root principles of our Baptist history. I'm a jurisdictionalist because I believe that Jesus is Lord of His church. Not the state, not the government, not the denomination, not some hierarchy, not the Pope, not a priest, or another preacher, or even the deacons of our church. Amen. Nor me. Jesus Christ is the preeminent one. Jesus Christ is Lord of His church. Amen. There's some things that we should expect in the service of the Lord. And I think we find these things in the book of Acts chapter 14. And it says in verse number 1, And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews. And so spake that a <coughs> that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil, affected against the brethren. Long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace, and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided. And part held with the Jews, and part with the apostles. And when there was an assault made both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews, with their rulers, to use them despitefully and to stone them, 
They were aware of it and fled unto Lystra and Derby, cities of Lyconia, and into the region that lieth round about. And there they preached the gospel. But then look at verse number 19. We pick up the story, and those that were in Iconium that, that hated the apostles and their message, uh, they, they showed back up in verse number 19. And it says, And there came thither certain, certain Jews of, uh, from Antioch and Iconium, her, uh, uh, who, 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 who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. And when they had preached the gospel to that city, and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples, and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them, elders in every church, and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. Amen. May I say this evening that there are some things that we should expect in the service of the Lord. Your service may be different than mine. Your calling may be different than mine. Uh, what God wants you to do may be different than me. And vice versa. But whatever our work is, whatever our service is, whatever God has laid on our hearts, whatever God has called us to do in the service of the Lord, there are some things that we should expect. Number one, we should expect to preach the Word. Uh, this is what the apostles did. Everywhere they went, they went into Iconium, they went into other areas, and they preached the Word of God to the city. We need the preaching of the Word of God. We have come here this week because we need the preaching of the Word of God. We're going to come back Wednesday evening because we need the preaching of the Word of God. We have a missionary that's coming in from Mexico City uh, to our church tomorrow evening. Why are we doing that? Because we need to hear the preaching of the Word of God. Uh, we, we're going to show back up next Sunday morning because we need the preaching of the Word of God. When we come to church, we should expect the Word of God to be preached. Amen. Not just a bunch of stories, not just a bunch of jokes, but the preaching and the teaching of the inspired, preserved Word of God. Amen. I believe that the King James Bible is the preserved, inspired Word of God. One day, one of our UBF uh, pastors, he uh, came to our church one, one Sunday morning. And uh, he, I, I noticed that, that, that when he came to town, he, he didn't come around as much as he, as he used to come around. And uh, so I, I, I saw him one day, and I, I said, uh, Brother So-and-so, I said, uh, uh, there just seems to be something wrong between you and me and our spirits. And, and, and I just I detected that something is wrong. And uh, he, he kind of mumbled a little bit, you know, and, and uh, he was kind of taken back that I confronted him with it. And, 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 and you know what? There, there's a way, you know, to, to tell the truth in love. Uh, we, we don't have to smack people around. We, we don't, you know, we think as Christians, we, you know, we just got to make everybody mad all the time. But we don't have to make everybody mad all the time. Once in a while, but not all the time. And, uh, and, and, and so I, I went to him, and I went to him in love, and I went to him in truth, and, and just, I, I, just, I just feel there's something wrong. And he said, well, he says, you, 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 you're not promoting the King James Bible as you used to. You know, you know they, they get that, that tone in their voice. You don't promote the King James Bible as you used to. You know. And uh, I said, really? I said, well, I said, I have a Baptist history month every, <laughs> every February. Uh, I run at least one family away every year from our church because they can't take Baptist doctrine, which is Bible doctrine. Uh, I'm always running somebody away when I have Baptist History Month every February. Um, and, and, I mean, I promote the King James Bible. The only thing I read is the King James Bible. Uh, I, I mean, I have other versions in my in my in my library, and and I refer to different things and different commentaries and different translations from time to time, but I study the Word of God, and, and I study the King James Bible, and I preach from the King James Bible. I prepare all my messages from the King James 
Bible. I said, I don't understand why you think we're not promoting the King James Bible. He said, well, I sat in the pew, and I looked around, and I could just tell there were people that had other, other translations in their life. <laughs> I said, really? I said, well, who were they? Well, I don't know. I don't know. I said, well, what translation was it? Well, I don't know, but I can tell. <coughs> I the translation. I said, really? So, well, I don't know who you're talking to, or, talk, or, or who you saw, or what you saw, but I don't know what you're talking about. So I assure him that I believe that the King James Bible is still the Word of God. Amen. Yeah. So the next Sunday morning, you know me, I just got up and told the story. I said, so I want everybody to stand that has a different translation in your lap than the King James Bible. I want to know who you are. And we, we had two men stand up over the right. And that's where he had sat. Uh, two men, two men stood up. Both men were not even members of our church. The first man, I can't remember who he was. The second man was a kid that had just that had, that had grown up in our church. Uh, he had a horrible addiction, horrible alcoholic, a hor horrible drug addict. He had just he had just graduated a year's program out of the Hebron. Uh, uh, program out of the Wheeler Mission in Indianapolis, Indiana, and and when you, and, and when you graduate from there, they baptize you, which is unscriptural, and uh, and there's another church, and and then they they give you a Bible, and it's usually something besides the King James Bible, and that's all he had. But you know what? He was in church. Right. Yeah. I'd rather be in church with a different translation than be at home with a King James Bible. On the shelf somewhere. Right. At least, at, at least you can train them. Yeah. It's an important time. That's right. I have a small group Bible study. We've got about we have about thirty small group Bible studies, and with our, our youth program uh, there in the city of Indianapolis, public schools, we we have about uh, uh, ninety different small groups all throughout the city of Indianapolis. I, I've got one in my home. And I live northeast, our church is southeast, and, and I've got a, a small group of home every Wednesday night for, uh, for all of our north side members to come, come, to come to. Well, I've been doing that for about 17, 18 years. Even before I moved to northeast, I was up on the north side with the north side members having a Bible study for them for about 18 years. And we've had different ones come and go and so on and so forth. And, and uh, a few, about, about six, seven years ago, I, I found about... There were about 10, 12, about a dozen people that were coming to my Bible study, and, and, and uh, about, about three-fourths of them weren't even members of our church. And every one of them came in with a different kind of Bible. I mean, just everything, every hodgepodge thing, <coughs> thing in the world. You know, and they, they'd come in, and, you know, I, I, never, I never preached at them, I never jumped on them, I never got on to them, I didn't say, you can't come back, you don't, get, you don't bring the real real Bible with you, and, and, uh, and uh, you know, they, they kept coming, and I'd read my Bible, and then they would read their Bible, and they'd read a passage, and, and then I would say, now let me explain to you uh, why my Bible sounds a little different than your Bible. And, and you know what? After about three or four years of teaching them, and by the way, let me say this, those people, most of them have joined our church, they have been baptized, and every single one of them has got the King James Bible. And I never even told them to go out and get one. I never even told them they had to have one. They just went out and finally bought them. I'll tell you something about my small group Bible study. They believe everything I tell them. Because they're my converts. Now my church, they don't believe half of what I tell them. <laughs> But that small group Bible study, they believe everything I say. And I kind of like it. I like people to believe what I have to say. Amen. <clears throat> we need to preach the Word. Amen. We, need, we need to know what the Word is. Right. And we need to preach the Word. You know, we get so caught up on, well, is it inspired or is it just preserved or is it preserved and inspired, inspired or inspired and preserved and and, uh, and and we, we get all so caught up in, in all these. All I all I know is when I preach it, it works. 
When I preach it, people get saved. When I preach it, people get sanctified. When I preach it, people's lives change. And, and their minds and their lives are transformed by the glorious preaching of the Word of God. I want you to know that if we're going to keep the faith, if, if we're going to if we're going to be in service for the Lord, we need to expect to preach the Word of God. Amen. There's something else that we need to expect. We need to expect people to get saved. Uh, every Sunday morning, when I go to church, and I preach the Word of God, and I give an invitation, I expect people to get saved. Amen. Now, they don't always get saved. Now, there are some people there, I think they need to get saved again. And again, and again, and again, until they just get it. But when I preach the Word of God, I expect people to get saved. People say, well, churches today, they're not giving invitations. This is what I say to them. Do you know why they don't? Because no one's coming forward, and it's embarrassing. That's why they stop giving invitations. If people were coming forward, they'd give invitations. They stop giving invitations because they're embarrassed that nobody's coming forward and responding to their message. And that's horrible for a preacher. That's right. That makes us look awfully bad. And I don't know if you know preachers very well, but we don't like looking bad. <laughs> Mrs. Fletcher, pastors are egomaniacs. We hold not looking bad. That's, that's why they stop. So, do you know why I give an invitation? Because when I give an invitation, there's hardly a Sunday that the altars aren't filled. Yeah, that's right. Now, it's not because of me. That's right. It's because of the Word. Amen. And it's not just because of the Word. It's because there are people that are sitting there that need to come forward. And so we work on getting lost people in, and we work on bringing uh, the homeless in, and we work, I mean, I mean, we bring about 15 to 20 homeless people in every single week, and we feed them after church, because the, the mission doesn't feed them on Sunday afternoon. And we feed them, for, for the last four years, we have fed them lunch, Sunday lunch, every single week. Amen. For three or four years. And we bring them in, and you know what? I've learned... Homeless people need Jesus. That's right. That's right. That's right. Homeless people know that they're sinners. That's right. Homeless people know that they're addicts and they need help. So if you bring some people into your church that need help, people come forward. That's right. Because people who come forward are people who need help. People who need help come forward. Amen. So we bring in kids and we bring in. I, I house seven homeless people. They're not homeless anymore. But I personally provide homes for seven, used to be homeless people, in Indianapolis. Now I'll tell you, that's tough. Because they have, they have a gifting mentality. Because everything's given to them. They get Obama phones. They get free food. They get food stamps. And don't just pick on Obama. They got Bush phones before that. That's right. <coughs> and you Bush that are here today. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he wasn't any better than Obama, hardly. That's right. That's right. In fact, once for him, Obama wouldn't even got elected. That's right. <laughs> they got the Republicans, man. <laughs> there you go, brother. Hannah, my third daughter, I've got four daughters, and Hannah, she, she's 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 kind of the, the fire. She's they, they call her they call her Doctor Nixon sometimes. <laughs> the fire. She's about fifth grade. She came home going to a Christian school, and uh, she she brings this paper home, and she she's got this this picture of of, of Martin Luther King Jr. I said, what in the world is that, Hannah? She's in fifth grade. What what do you have? Well, this is Martin Luther King Jr. I said, well, who is he? I knew who he was. I wanted to know if she knew who he was. Well, you know, she began to tell me. She said, my teacher said he was a good Christian. Now, she, he, she goes to a good Christian school. He's a good Christian. I said, really? I said, did you know the night before he got assassinated, he was with two white prostitutes? 
Hannah's in fifth grade. Hannah looks at me and says, what's a prostitute? <laughs> Some things just need to be left alone. <laughs> she came home a few weeks later. She has, she's got this picture of George W. Bush. I said, who is this? That's the president. I said, what are you doing? She said, well, we're learning about him. Really? Same story again. Yeah. I said, uh, I said, well, what about him? Well, my teacher said he's a good Christian. I said, really? I said, you know, the first thing he did when he got elected was steal our church. <laughs> I said, really? I said, really? <coughs> On both occasions, she went back, fifth grade. She's the Dr. Nixon of her family. <laughs> she wears her face right up here. She raises her hand. The teacher says, yes, Hannah, what would you like to say? My daddy said, <laughs> I hadn't met the teacher up to that point, and I wasn't really sure that I wanted to after that. <coughs> I don't know what all that had to do with my message tonight, but we just didn't expect people to get saved. <laughs> Martin Luther King Jr. needs to get saved. Yeah. <laughs> George W. Bush, he needs to get saved. I don't know. We, 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 we need to expect people to get saved. That's right. right. Amen. Talk about homeless people. We don't give invitations because no one's getting saved in our churches today. We, we need to go out and get some sinners so we can get them saved. Amen. When the apostles preached the word of God, they expected people to get saved. And you know what? Some did. Some did. It doesn't matter if you're winning one person a year or 10 people a year, or 100 people a year. We just need to be winning somebody. Amen. When we're doing the service of the Lord, expect to preach the word. Expect people to get saved. Number three, expect God to do something. Amen. Just expect God to do something. I, I, I don't think that we expect God to do anything. God hasn't done anything for so long, we just, we just don't expect anything anymore. That's right. I'll be very truthful. Sometimes, in fact, almost every Sunday, I'll be, and all the members of our church, just close your ears right now, I don't want you to hear this, uh, but, but I'm, I'm, I, I come down the interstate, I come down I-65, I get to Southport exit, exit number 103, and, uh, and I'll tell you, almost every, I, I get the heebie-jeebies right before I start to turn off, and I'm going to keep on driving to Kentucky. <laughs> Not because I love Kentucky so much. I just want to keep on driving down the south, I-65, I don't care where it takes me. I don't want to get off. I'm nervous. I'm afraid nothing's going to happen. But I know if I don't show up, nothing will happen. That's right. Maybe I'm afraid if I don't show up, something will happen. They <laughs> <laughs> don't think they'll need me. I just kind of get nervous. You preachers ever get nervous? Amen. Or have we just done this for so long that it just doesn't matter anymore? We're just going through the motions. We, we need to expect God to do something. It says in verse 3, Long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of His grace, and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. I realize that signs and wonders aren't for today. I, I understand that. I understand that that signs and wonders and tongues and all those things. Uh, I understand that they were for an unbelieving Jew. I, I, I understand all that. They, they were sign gifts. I understand all that. But I want you to know, God still wants to do wonderful things in our midst. And we should expect God to do so when we are in His service. Look at verse number 20. It says, How be it as the disciples stood around about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to the city and had taught many, they returned again, and they confirmed the souls. They exhorted them to continue in the faith. They talked about entering the kingdom of God and the tribulation, the problems, the difficulties of doing so. Things happen. Nothing has happened in our churches for so long. We don't think anything could ever happen again. We need to expect Amen. God just to do something. 
yes, yes. Come on, a, a mouse run up your dress or something. Make you squeal. Something. Something to get you excited. Somebody hasn't been excited so long. Mouse will do you wonders. <laughs> Expect God to do something. That's right. In the service of the Lord, we should expect something else. Expect opposition. We see the opposition here in Acts chapter 14 to the apostles over and over and over and over again. Opposition. If we're going to do truly the service of the Lord, people are going to hate us. People are going to dislike us. People are going to stand against us. People in the church, our good church members sometimes, are even going to stand against us. We're going to make somebody mad. I always tell people, I have the privilege of getting up every Sunday morning and I have the propensity and the opportunity to make somebody mad every Sunday morning. <laughs> what a great occupation. Amen. And I don't even have to try most of the time. I just have to get up and just look at it when I make them mad. Amen. It just doesn't make them much. Some of us are just very irritated. Some preachers are very irritated. They don't say anything in the irritation. They just walk through the back door and they're irritated. Of course, if you would irritate us so much, we probably wouldn't be so irritated. We, we just need to expect opposition. Things are going to happen. Amen. What did Paul the Apostle say? He, 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 talked about, he talked about the problems in the church and the care of the church. Pastors don't like to dismiss people from their churches. In fact, we're, we're trying to get as many to come in as possible. We're not trying to, we're not trying to have an exodus to the best of our ability. <laughs> but kind of like my, my father always used to say, a church is like a body. It has to assimilate and it has to eliminate. <laughs> Every church, some of you have got some slow people here. I know in Kentucky they're slow sometimes, so I'm going to say it again. Everybody is like a church. It has to assimilate, and it has to eliminate. Opposition outside the church is one thing. Opposition, opposition inside the church is a whole other problem. That's right. It's worse. It's worse. It, it's, it's hard to see friends of a lifetime walk out and never come back. And that hurts. I never joke. There's always going to be somebody that is going to stand against our authority. That wants to be the authority. That wants to have the 
preeminence. That wants to be in charge. That wants to call the shots. We need to expect opposition in the service of the Lord. I'm going to tell you the loneliest person in this room today. Ready? Pastor Fletcher. He is the loneliest person at Vicar Dallas Church. The pastors here in your respective churches, you are the loneliest person in your church. Surrounded by maybe hundreds, but you're the loneliest person We need to expect, in the service of the Lord, opposition. Amen. There's a fifth thing that we need to expect. We need to expect, in spite of all the above, we need to expect determination. Yes. Look what the Bible says in verse number 22. <clears throat> Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. We need some determination. Not to quit. Not to give up. Not to throw in the towel. Get over whatever we have to get over. And keep on moving. Expect determination. We'll never amount to anything without determination. We'll never accomplish anything without determination. We'll never build a church without determination. We'll never win people to Christ without determination. We'll never do the service of the Lord without determination. We won't get up here week in and week out, Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night and wherever we meet, and, and study and preach and prepare and give forth the Word of God and do the work of God in the service of God without some determination. Yes, yes, yes. It takes determination. Right. So many people give up so easily, so, so, so easily. Expect determination. Let me say in closing, expect in the service of the Lord, expect success. I am not a defeatist. I expect success. Amen. You, you know why we, we aren't successful in the service of the Lord? Is because we quit, quit so soon. That's right. We, we quit right before God's ready to bless. That's just how God works. If, if, if God just blesses every time we turn around, uh, it would be wonderful. It would be great. But, but there would be no faith in that. But God waits, and He waits, and He waits, and He waits, and He wants to see what our motive is for service. And He wants to see what, why, what, why we're serving Him, and, and why we're doing what we're doing. And, uh, and, and, and if we just hang in there long enough, and those that do hang in there long enough, I want you to know, success takes place. Success is right around the corner. So turn the corner. Amen. Turn the corner. You know, I was the pastor of the church when the IRS attacked us. I was the pastor of the church when they came and shut it down. I was the pastor of the church. I don't know if you're catching this. I was the pastor of the church when all the bad publicity hit. But my father was all correct. <laughs> he wasn't even anywhere around. He got me into all this trouble. I'm smarter than that. I wouldn't have been in trouble if they just left me alone. He got me in all this trouble. <laughs> See, I'm more diplomatic.
I would have gone into those officials and, and I would have I would have worked something out with them. I would have talked them out of the problem and the difficulty. But no, he has to take a stick and hit the beast upside the head about ten times. Ben wants to know why they're biting his head off. The dog's gonna bite you if you hit it and kick it. I'm glad that we're a team. Amen. As I said yesterday or this morning, I'm glad that he dug up the foundation and demoed the foundation and sledgehammered the foundation. And God called him to do that. He didn't call me to do that. He called him to do that. He, he called Elijah and Elisha to do a couple of different things that were different. Right. But their ministry dovetails together. Right. I hope our ministry dovetails together. God called him to tear up the foundation. Right. But he's called me to build on the foundation. Right. I believe because we are unregistered Baptist churches, <coughs> we should be the best unregistered Baptist church in our cities. Yes. I believe we should be the best that we can be. Amen. Let me tell you one way that we try to do that, and this is going to make some of you mad, but that's okay. I don't confuse theology and methodology. Let me say that again. I don't confuse theology and methodology. 
Now, some of the older people in our church, they don't like all my methods. My father doesn't like all my methods. One day, he said to me, What's that song you're singing? I told him, Where'd you get that thing at? <laughs> I said, What are you so worried about a song? It's Christian words. You don't know it. Does that make it wrong? It's a praise and worship song. Well, I just don't want people to criticize you, he said. I said, really? Just a minute. You don't want people to criticize me? People have criticized you all your life. I said, you're worried about a little song? You put Mongo the gorilla out in the parking lot and he threw a gorilla crap. I'm going to say that because Brother Sullivan said it, so I'm going to get away with it. Threw, 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 threw gorilla crap at old women when they walked out of church. And you're worried about what people say of, say of me because of a little song? <laughs> Mongo the gorilla. And he, and he didn't want me to be criticized. <laughs> He had the Walt Dinsies come in the park and they had their little outfits on and they were, they were, they were, and he didn't want, and he worried about someone criticizing me over a little song. We had the biggest man, the littlest man, the biggest woman, the fattest woman, the skinniest woman. We had every freak show in the world to get people in church, you say. And you're worried about a praise and worship song? I haven't even begun. <laughs> I'm trying to fill the time. <laughs> we need to expect in the service of the Lord success. Amen. Yes, Lord. You do it your way. I'll do it my way. As long as people are getting saved, I won't criticize you. Don't criticize me. <coughs> Because I don't confuse theology with methodology. Amen. We can't use the same methods that we used in the 40s and the 50s to reach the 21st generation. That's why our churches are dying. That's right. Because we're still trying to do the same thing the same way, because that's what we're used to. And it's hard to break out of that. We need to expect success. As I said earlier this morning, we're getting ready to plant, the Lord willing, the next 10 months, five more churches, which will give us 25 churches in the last 14 years. And may I say, they're all unregistered Baptist churches. We don't plant churches that are not Baptist. We don't plant churches that don't use the King James Bible. We don't help pastors and plant churches that are not unregistered. Over the last five years, we've taken four trips to the state of Oaxaca in Mexico, and our church has adopted the state of Oaxaca, going back next July again with hopefully about 25 or 30 people. We're going to plant two more churches down there. Amen. We're going to have three or four vacation Bible schools going simultaneously with cell groups uh, throughout Oaxaca City. We're going to marry a couple that's already been living together and has two children. We're going to marry them that we've been ministering to over the last five years. And, uh, and the Lord willing, we're going to build a building a church building for the church that we planted five years ago. About three years ago, I flew to Monterey, Mexico, the top of the country, and we got in a car, four of us, and we drove all the way to Oaxaca City. It took us seven days. We drove every day four to ten hours. We preached in a different Baptist church every night. On Thursday night, you know Brother Gwen, Hiles Anderson did? Uh, 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 not Brother Gwen. Uh, forget his name now. Uh, 3,000 people on Thursday night for a midweek service. We had 14 saved. <laughs> Went all the way to the mountains of Zaragoza, where one of our Spanish pastors in Annapolis grew up. Never even knew America existed until he was 16 years old. His uncle took him to Mexico City for the first time, and someone told him about America, and he thought, oh, I could go there sometime. <laughs> We went all the way to the mountains of Zaragoza. 
he goes back every so often, he's cleared a piece of land and he's built a hut for a community center in, in the mountains of Zaragoza that is also the church building. And we just went into a place called Santo Domingo outside of Oaxaca City and just started witnessing, leading people to Christ who were related to our Spanish pastor, another Spanish pastor in Indianapolis, Indiana, Manuel San Diego. And we led his family members to Christ. I stayed in his brother's home, Fernando and his wife, and they gave me their bedroom, and I looked over, and there was a satanic Bible five years ago. I was there back in May, and the satanic Bible's not there anymore. They've been saved, they've been baptized. Praise the Lord. I believe in the service of the Lord, we should expect success. Yeah. We just began our ninth year in our new building that God has given us. That's right. For five and a half years, we didn't have a building, and I never dreamed that we would ever have one again. I, I believe that I would spend the rest of my life, the rest of my ministry, in just rented facilities and banquet halls and schools. Never dreamed that God would give to us a 76,000 square foot uh, sports center. They had no idea. They had no idea. I've come to love that verse in Luke where it says, if you give up father and mother and property and lands and houses and for my sake and follow me. I will give back to you a hundredfold in this life and in the, and in the life to come. In the age to come. We have experienced that over the last eight years. Over the last 14 years. God has been so good to us. We don't deserve it. He's been so good to us. Why are we doing what we're doing if we're not expect expecting success? Now, success is spelled differently. I understand that. For different people. Success to you may be different for me, and success to me may be different than it is to you. But whatever it means to you, we should expect God's work to go forward. Amen. 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 And we'll just keep doing it. And keep doing it. And keep doing it. Amen. Do it. And keep doing it. And keep doing it. I believe good things will take place. Amen. Don't give up. Don't get weary and well doing. That's right. In the service of the Lord, yes. we need to expect some things. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. said uh, what you did about uh, God calls men to different methods you know uh, God has some warriors God has some worshipers God has some workers amen right. and I, I told someone that, uh, I think today uh, when I got saved my pastor was one of the most compassionate men I'd ever seen I mean he could cry over a dead fly. And uh, I didn't have any tears over a dead fly. And I thought, Lord, I don't have any compassion. I can't preach. Then I started reading bi uh, biographies. I read about J. Frank Norris. And I said, well, praise God. There's some fighters. There's some warriors. And there's some worshipers. And there's some workers. God uses all of us. Amen. Amen. And uh, so thank God for the warriors too. And the workers, working for all of us. It takes all to get the job done. I'll tell you right. that. That's right. Uh, now, 
Brother Dixon, you wanted to meet with the preachers right after we want to go ahead and dismiss everybody. And no, this, uh, this is uh, uh, for everybody. Uh, Brother Paul Zander has this resolution on the homeschooling. Okay. Because this is for everybody, all of the lay folks and everybody uh, votes on this, and he can come up and read that real quick. Okay, just take a few minutes of the Paul, come ahead if you've got that and uh, where you at. We just, we just take a couple of minutes to read that yeah. and then take a vote. Okay, this is on a resolution for the UCB. Let me uh, uh, say one more thing. Well, your time is not coming up. Uh, you know, I was looking at the sign up here, unregistered Baptist church, uh, churches. We need to know who we are, amen? Amen. Uh, we have identity, and that identity is unregistered Baptist. That's who we are. That's who we stand for. And so, know who you are, above all things. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, he was talking with Dr. Dixon yesterday to, uh, he asked if there was any resolution. Mm -hmm. uh, many of you know our pastor, Jim Grove, um, has gone to be with the Lord last January, two Januarys ago. And one of the concerns that he had was for the future of the education of our children. And uh, he often spoke about it. And was concerned about um, something that we could do as a church to protect the future of our young people. And um, so I don't, I don't want to take too much time here. I know that uh, you all have been here a good while, but uh, I just this is the resolution. a bit of change here. So I just want to give you a little background on that before I read the resolution. And um, this is something that I wrote and it probably needs a few more whereas if you guys have read any of these resolutions. So. Um, this is what the Lord gave us at our church, and we adopted it. And I just want to say very quickly, we do something in our church, and that is a, I don't want to say the word school, we do a teaching ministry ID, Heritage Baptist Teaching Ministry. And um, we had to give uh, one of those ID cards to all of our children. That way, if they're seen in public, somebody says, where do you go to church? They can say, we're part of Heritage Baptist Teaching Ministry. Now, where, where do they go to school? Forgive me. Go to school. I apologize. I'm under the influence of cold medicine, so I'm praising the patient. And, um, okay, so let's just give you a little bit of background there. It says, uh, whereas the teaching of Scripture has led us to believe that we are bound to hold fast to that which has been evidently set forth by God's holy writ and recorded prior to this resolution throughout history by Anabaptists and true converts alike both by antiquity and action. These convictions and beliefs, having been born in obedience to God, affirm these scriptural truths to rightly gain and humbly seek the blessing of the Father of lights in the education and enlightenment of these our little ones. Whereas Webster's 1828 Dictionary states, defining education is as to inform and enlighten the understanding and we recognize that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and that the entrance of God's word, thy words, giveth light, and again it giveth understanding unto the simple, and that fallen man hath willfully thrown off God, Psalm 2, to teach that which is contrary to his will, and some hath attempted to bind many to submit both by false law and threat of punishment and imprisonment to ordinances which God hath not ordained. Nor does he recognize them to be law at all, for there is one lawgiver, and he is our judge. Whereas the ecclesiastical authority which God hath granted to this his church is recognized by we the members, and we do humbly submit to this our duty. For the scripture records, we can do nothing against the truth. And um, so it says, we are to teach, to educate, and to train these children to whom we have been entrusted. For we know that the Bible says children are inherited to the Lord. We are compelled and commanded by God to be used of him to mediate their path and show them the way. Jesus himself, desiring to have fellowship with all who would come to him, expressly stated, Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not. And again, all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. Therefore, the Lord himself is to be their teacher in all forms of their education. And believing that God has gifted to us the ability, knowledge, and wisdom to direct their hearts towards him. 
For the scripture concludes, he gave some teachers for the perfecting of the saints and for the work of the ministry. I believe that home education and child education is a ministry of the church. Mm -hmm. And um, I believe God has given to us there in Ephesians 4.11 that scripture where it does conclude that every local ecclesiastical body is gifted to teach and to enlighten that one might be wise and confess that this is not only to be our duty, but a ministry of this his church body. Now, although many have asserted a standard that is state or federally accepted, we find these to be wanting, for they have not taught the way of the Lord, nor have they submitted to it by any means. Hence, if this body of believers were to submit to those which have not submitted to his law, we would be found in sin. I believe that's the biggest issue. I believe the Lord Jesus Christ is head of the church, yeah. and uh, I believe my children do belong to him. And, um, and I've tried to teach that to our people. And uh, to turn my children over to the public pool system, I believe, would be 100% sin. Amen. And um, I believe that with all my heart. Whereas God has set us as parents and teachers under his authority to teach and train at all times, to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might, and these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart, shall teach them diligently unto thy children, shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. I appreciate the scriptures here that the brother shared on that the other day. I didn't look at them there with my eyes. But, um, knowing that our willful adherence to allow any to convince or convey teaching contrary to this command would place us in contempt to this our heavenly judge. Believing again our calling in office is to affirm these scriptural precepts. For scripture concludes that children are to obey their parents in the Lord, for this is right. It's pretty simple there, isn't it? Amen. And seen today among all who submit to ungodly state ordained authority is the compulsion to submit to superintendents, teachers, administrators, to whom this authority has not been given by God. And as a result, many a child has turned from honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, to turn in thy father and mother, that thy year will go well with thee, and the graves may be good that I give thee. So that's the resolution. And I gave it to him because I knew that it needed some help, but nothing's been done to it. I've just been asked to read it. So if there's something that we want to do different, or no, just accept it as it is, then that's all right, that's a good resolution, brother. Did Brother Grove uh, uh, work on this? Yeah, I, 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 that's good. All right, fine. And uh, is there a second that we uh, accept, receive this resolution, and we'll release this to the public? Is there, Brother Paul Davis? All right. Is there a second on this? Brother Paul Davis. All right. Brother Martin Jones. All in favor of this resolution being uh, presented by the. This unregistered Baptist fellowship say amen. Amen. On homeschooling, on, on uh, Christian schooling, homeschooling. All right. Amen. All right. That's good. We'll have one, by the way, tomorrow night we'll have one uh, in support of Brother uh, uh, Kent Hovind. We'll have that ready for you tomorrow night. Amen. All right, don't forget in the morning we'll start at 9 o'clock. We've got some uh, coffee and donuts ready for you to come early. Nine o'clock, we've got some special speakers tomorrow, and some more preachers coming in tomorrow. So uh, be here at, at least by nine o'clock, earlier possible. We have one day left, that's all we've got. Been good, amen? Amen. This stand will be dismissed. All right, uh, this has really been a good, really been a good uh, conference that we've had this year. We thank God for it. Brother Boyd is going to be preaching tomorrow night, so we'll be praying for him tomorrow night as he comes. And so, uh, uh, Brother Martin, would you dismiss us in prayer? Father, we thank you for your blessing upon us. Thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for what it does in our hearts and our lives. Being proclaimed today, thank you for it. I would thank you for those who have, uh, have preached and Pray your blessing upon me. I pray that uh, tomorrow will be pleasing to you. That you give us rest tonight. Help us to serve you acceptably. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
God bless you. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the last amen on the unregistered Baptist 30th celebration here in Paducah, Kentucky. Come back tomorrow morning. We'll be live again at 9 a.m. Paducah time, and uh, we'll be filming this and sharing it with you. May God bless you. May God help you. If you'd like to get in touch with me, remember, 202-747-4839, or you can email me, wileywiley at att.net. May God bless, and may God give you a great, great evening. Good night, and God bless.